and welcome to another new episode of Clockwork Brothers podcast. Today on this podcast, we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. We're going to talk about something that's much more ephemeral. We are going to talk about something perennial, something within all of our minds, something that we think about every now and again that haunts us, something we wish wasn't there. Today, we're going to talk about death. Yeah, that's right. You heard me. Death. Now, you're probably thinking, why are we talking about death? Let's talk about life, Mo. Let's talk about how how awesome it would be to to do what we've always dreamt of doing. And, and most of our episodes are dedicated to that. But you soon come to realize that death and life are different sides of the same coin. By studying death, you can better understand life. In fact, you understand life much more when you study death. This is something that's quite obvious to filmmakers or storytellers because a never-ending story is a meaningless one. When a story ends, it gains meaning. It gains depth. Like all stories, our life, or each and every one of us, is a different story that we can tell. It's a different story of love, of hate, of revenge. And we all have to understand to see ourselves for who we are, because... I think every now and again, everyone, they come to the realization that life is a very scary thing. Life is a scary thing because of the unknown. Because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Perhaps tomorrow you'll wake up. And you know what? Everything goes right. You get that right phone call. All the opportunities open up. You're wealthy, you're healthy, and you're enjoying the life you've always dreamt of enjoying. You help people, and people are grateful. And sometimes there's the fear that you may wake up, and everything is complete shit. That's a possibility, and that's scary about life. But that's something very subjective. Some might say that that's the beauty of life. You know, there's lots of analogies that compare light, that compare light with darkness, and claim that darkness is meaningless without light, and light is meaningless without darkness. And this is a, an axiom of polarity. It's a principle that many have followed throughout the ages, through different civilizations, the the idea of of polarity, the idea of two things, of, of twins and so forth, the idea of two different things corresponding to each other, has been very powerful. And if you read books on comparative studies of mythology, religion, and anthropology, then that becomes just much more clear that there are certain laws, certain human traits and beliefs that are quite universal. I think everyone has had a run-in with with death or maybe even thought of it for a long time. Plenty of us has, have seen many older family members maybe pass away or even young ones at an illness or tragedy. And what's always amazed me is how people, no matter how old they are, no matter what they've experienced in life, there are two things I always seem to notice. Firstly, that no one is prepared. No one is ever prepared to die. There's never the right time to die. There's always something to be doing and an aim and a party to go to. And the second thing I notice which again has been very interesting to me, is that I've seen grown men, 
cry. These old men, you know, with with self belief and conviction, fear death. They fear the end. That they're willing to do anything, anything, just to escape it, to escape from the inescapable. You know, they'd spend fortunes on cures and beg, beg of any deity or any other kind of perceived life, life form to extend their life. And something has become clear to me. I don't want neither of those traits. I want to A, be ready, and two, be fearless. Because life is scary. It's already scary. You just have to confront it. There is no hand-holding. There is no writer writing your story for you. Your actions are the ink and time is the paper. You are the pen. You create your existence. I don't want to be on my last breath crying and <laughs> maybe I will be. Maybe I will be. I don't know what it's going to be like. You know, most most of us, we, we wish that we're much older. You know, we hope that we're like, I don't know, 100. We have like a big extended family with kids of kids of kids and, you know. But we don't feel time. The reason we're not prepared, the reason no one is prepared is because we spend our lives asleep. We're not awake to enjoy it. This is why very few people are prepared to die. This is why you have characters like Gandhi, people like Che Guevara, you know, like Malcolm X, these figures who were so alive. They were so alive that it didn't matter to them that their life would end. Because they were more alive than anyone else. I look at these figures and I wonder, you know, what went through their minds. You know, I look at what's happening around us and all I see are babies. Okay, now, that's not, that sounds a bit weird, but let me explain that. I see large bodies but the hearts and innocence of children in these adults. Everyone's too ignorant. People are too innocent to realize the nature and gravity of what this is. Just self-awareness should be scaring us silly. That's a pretty big deal, to be self-aware. You know, we live our lives, we're not aware of being self-aware. And sometimes some people have this this moment in their lives where i'm sure you might have had this too i know i have where you've just woken up and the sudden fear hits you and you ask yourself the first time in your life where am i and then your mind tells you this you're in life you're, you're in reality you're sitting in your room you've just woken up but you're awake more than you've ever been. And then you ask the question, and why am I here? And it feels scary. Nothing can feel scarier than that. I'm sure many people have had this, but I'm also sure some people aren't aware of this or they haven't thought about it. That, that really rock hard, just pounding your brain receives when when you're fully consciously aware of, of, of your existence and of your mortality, because then immediately when you're having this experience, your brain just jumps, it goes to another level, it goes, okay, so where was I before? And where am I going now? You know, is this just another part of the journey? And your brain goes into overdrive mode. So many thoughts are rushing through your head, so many experiences, so many faces, 
and then you just snap up. You just snap awake as if it was just another dream, another daydream. You think nothing of it. And then several months later, it reappears. It happens again. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's experienced this. I've spoken to others who've, who've experienced this. But I'm sure it's just it's a much more kind of archetypal thing that we as the human species do perceive and feel. I think that the human species is the most cowardly species in the face of the planet of the earth. We are the most fearful. Do not confuse our wild and extraordinary intelligence for courage. Okay? And the reason I say that is because all other species, they're true to themselves. They don't lie to themselves. And perhaps part of the reason why they may be so courageous is they don't have the scope of our minds to kind of think about things so deeply. So that might, that might give them an advantage. But I've never seen, I've never seen like a dog worried about tomorrow. <laughs> he doesn't care. He's living in the now. And I think, you know, our animal friends have a point. You know, we need to live in the now. We need to be, we need to praise every moment of our lives. We need to be fearless. We need to stop crying and misery and just, I know this has been said often, that when you think about your actions and you consider your mortality, that everything just dissolves and there is no fear any longer. Because just, just the knowledge knowing that within a hundred years from now, everyone will be dead. That other people's perceptions of you won't really matter is one of the most liberating things you can do or feel. And it's true. It's very true. Most people, the reason they don't do what they do is because they haven't thought about this. If they have, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. You, most people go with the flow. You go with the flow. I go with the flow. But to what degree? To what extent? There are people who are doing things they don't want to do, who are living a lie they don't want to live. They're living a lie. If they thought of these things, they wouldn't be doing that. They, 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 people can't realize that reality is within the grasps of their own hands. They can just reach it and grab it. They, they can make it whatever they want. I'm not saying you can force, you know, you, you can force others to do what you want. You might be able to convince them to live a life that's in accordance with, with your ideology. And I'm not saying that you can completely bend the will of the universe and the will of God to your desires. I'm not pushing forward the view of solipsist nihilism and hedonism, although those are pretty nice. But um, I'm, I'm just trying to say that we've been conditioned to be helpless through most of our lives. Childhood itself conditions us to be weak and, and to be passive objects acted upon by you, the universe around us. Now, these are hard words coming from someone who's somewhat a determinist to, to a certain degree. To a certain degree, I am a determinist. And for those that don't know what the word determinist means or what it denotes is the fact that many things that we see in our lives, many actions and, and accidents and everything that you see has a large part to do with things that are beyond our control like a mechanical universe that push something onto us but recently the more i've been thinking about these things i've kind of been changing my mind you know i've i've, I've moved from being a hardcore determinist to being kind of a soft determinist in that the mind is just so complex the task the process of decision making is so tough that i I've, I've managed to somehow kind of doubt the mechanical nature of our minds. You know, I've somehow been able to give the idea of free will more power. In my head, the idea that you can create your reality has just been getting more and more convincing. So how do we apply this to our everyday lives? 
you know, where, where do we go from here? You know, you might be listening to this, you might be on your computer, or perhaps you're on a train ride or a bus ride, and you're tuning in, and you're thinking, okay, well, that's all well, well and good, and Mo, this is probably stuff people before you have said. There were philosophers, greater philosophers than you, who have spoken these things. There are people speaking these things through their art. There are characters such as Van Gogh, who perhaps you see the the suffering in his paintings and the contemplation in his each stroke of his brush. But Mo give us something practical. And this is where I kind of kind of cheese the question. Everyone's different. You have to figure that out for yourself. Some things can only be experienced. They cannot be told. I can push you in that direction. But I can't take that information and that experience and just push it into your brain. There's this brilliant thought experiment known as the knowledge argument. Also known as Mary's Room or Mary the Super Scientist. <laughs> and it was this thought experiment was proposed by Frank Jackson. And he talks about qualia. What's qualia, you ask? Qualia is a term, or well, mostly we use it in philosophy. And it's a, it's a term that talks about, you know, how we see things or literally our conscious experience. You know, the uh, subjective reality that we experience. And this, not, this argument called the knowledge argument argues that knowledge is sometimes not enough. This is how the thought experiment works. There's a girl called Mary. She lives in a room that's completely composed of monochrome. There's no color. She lives in a black and white room. But in this room, and also she can't see herself and there's no mirrors. Just for this thought experiment to work, you have to kind of visualize something like this. A woman who has never experienced color, like she's heard of it. And she has many books talking about these things, ex ex just ex explaining everything to her with visual charts of the electromagnetic spectrum just explained out to her and all these books and information and knowledge is provided to Mary, you know? This stuff is given to her. She, she's told, okay, the color red looks like this. This is how the cones in your eyes, as the light hits them through your, you know, the back of your eye and your brain receives this impulse, the signal, sound interprets it. You know, she can spend years and years and years studying the perception of a color studying the qualia of a color but she'll never know what it means she'll know how it becomes she'll know what it, you know she wish she'll never know she'll never know one day mary goes outside somehow this prison set up in this disgusting thought experiment is open to her she's allowed to leave this terrible room of torture you know with no color because colors is pretty nice and she goes outside and in the distance first of all she's amazed that is i mean the, the sky is blue and the, the grass is green and she's read all about this and she sees she sees a rose in the distance she looks at it and she sees the rose is red she thinks wow so that's what red is I had no idea what it was. And all these, you know, this kind of idea can be applied to other senses. It could be applied to your sense of smell. It could be applied to your sense of hearing, to your sight, to your touch, to anything, any kind of, any of the five senses. You can apply that to it and you realize very quickly that that's what you need. I tend to take that perception in regards to learning and understanding these things. I believe contemplation is a prerequisite to all human life. I believe that it should be compulsory, okay? I think it should be in the education system. 
to talk about these things, philosophy and and to question everything, rather than your run of the mill, hey look, let's just memorize this bunch of text, let's memorize this and that and just blurt it out whenever we're asked to. And this is currently what the educational system is like, but I don't want to get into that too much. Okay. I mean, there is a way for me and others to kind of pave a path, pave a path to help other people see what we see. And that's to look around you, to look at the people that perhaps you admire and to break them down. Okay, you're being opinionated, but you're doing it at a different level. I want you to find someone you highly adore and see what makes them. If you have access to said person, you can see their past. You can read about their biographies. or You can even see what books they've read. Books are a huge indicator of what a person's views would be like or, or indicator of, of how their mind works to a certain degree. Find some of your greatest heroes and read what they read. Find the mistakes they done. See them as, as you'd see yourself. Completely mortal. Completely capable of error. Break them down. Then look at your life. And try to find a different perspective. See yourself through the eyes of an observer. Three, see yourself through the eyes of an observer with dramatic irony. Now, the reason I say dramatic irony is because you're an observer of yourself. You know this person's, <clears throat> you know more about that person than the person knows. So, if you were to see your friend, for example, and you can read his mind, and you want, you know, for example, he wants to be a pianist, or I don't know, he wants to go to the moon. I don't know, and he's not acting on it for said reason, and you know, for example, that someone else is trying to stop him, and he doesn't know about that. And you can see the irony in, in, in how you're aware of all these things, but he's not, you know? In his mind, maybe he doesn't know the limit of his mortality. He doesn't know how long he'll live. You know, maybe you know that in a, in a certain amount of time, he'll die. How stupid would his decisions look with his mind that's obsessed with these little intricacies that have no value to his life be? You know, some people see the, the steps that were taken by those that have died as being insane, being very dangerous. I can't tell you whether I'm ready to take such a step. There are those that have lived before us who have overcome adversity. There are those who have faced enemies that were willing to destroy them and their families if they stood their ground to fight for what they believe in, to breathe their last breath the way it was meant to be. You can only stand in awe at the conviction of these men and women. For example, if you look at the singer Bob Marley, just his drive to go on, his drive to pursue what he felt was right even in the face of killers, thoughtless fools, idiots that are so segregated from their fellow man that they seek to kill him. When I told you earlier to look at other people and analyze them, I want you to also analyze the dictators and those that you consider the most evil. You know, most people would go for Hitler or other dictators such as Saddam Hussein or maybe even you'd go for a serial killer and beneath the bravado beneath this image of anger and just power and destruction there lies an innocent child all these people were once innocent children and you see that they act out these things because they're so destroyed because they're so weak they're so weak that they can't accept the universe for what it is. When they lash out at other people, 
when they commit crimes. That's them projecting their weakness onto others. Some of them might claim that the way, what they're doing are crimes for the benefit of humanity. But those without mercy will never benefit humanity. And now for a break. Hey man, you think somewhere out there, around the world, someone else is listening to the Clockwork Brothers? Why yes, I do think so. I mean, why wouldn't they? Welcome back to the second half of the Clockwork Brothers podcast, this time on death. And I do realize that this this week's podcast has been quite uh, scary. <laughs> but um, I do feel that this is a topic worthy for, for not only just creatives, but just anyone that's willing to just grow and develop themselves further. Because the symbol of the skull, which is often used to symbolize death, is ubiquitous throughout most of the world. From a very young age, we learn that all things must die, all living things eventually die. And as human beings, by the way, I don't think we're the only species capable of considering the aspect of death. I think animals understand this as well. But I think we're capable of really kind of going deeper into the topic. And the topic of immortality, the theme of immortality, which is covered in Neo Empire as well, in the latest uh, work, is again quite common amongst human societies that even in Egypt, when they mummified a dead body, they expected the person to you know, live in the afterlife, live in the as the Book of the Dead claims, you know, they'll do after they've passed away. But I'm not here to debate what happens. Because to most of you in this discussion, what we're talking about, it doesn't matter. Because I'm not talking about how to die. Okay, the, the point of what we're talking about today is how to live. By studying death, you can figure out how to live and where you want to live and how to, how you want to live you know i look at myself how i was before and you know everyone's constantly changing there's certain aspects of yourself that you can't change or perhaps you know i think every aspect can be swayed but certain things like certain uh, like certain habits of speech or modes of thoughts can't be changed, but your beliefs can. Your your perspective can be changed. And I believe the change of perspective is a magical thing. To change a perspective is a... Wow, it's a massive thing when you think about it. You know, just to, to kind of give you an example of perspective and how important perspective is to life. Think about someone who can walk a tightrope. Or not even a tightrope, not even something very difficult. Think about someone who can walk in a on like a very high skyscraper on like a path that's quite big, you know, gives you enough space to stand with both of your feet on it. Now, if you were to tell someone on the ground to walk in a straight line and to walk within a certain range, they'll be able to do it with ease. You know, unless they're drunk, they'll be easily able to do it. But put them on a, as, as soon as the context changes, everything changes you know and it's the same thing with life people don't believe that they can do their thing people don't believe that they can i don't know 
start their own company or they don't believe that that they can cure certain illness and it's that belief it's that sense of hopelessness which puts us at the mercy of our own of our own pessimism and you know there's a reason why they call death the liberator because with it there's nothing to fear if you don't fear it and I think everyone to a certain degree no matter how brave they are there is fear because it's unknown you know don't people want lies to kind of comfort them or just to kind of make something that's really tough a bit easier to deal with but in all honesty the reason death is death is because you don't know anything about it if it was if you did then it wouldn't be so bad you know it's it's a bit if you ask me it's a bit exciting because it's the unknown and you know it could be very shitty but it, it could be pretty awesome you know maybe all the theories about it being another world that's better heaven and things like that you know who who might say that's who might doubt that all you need to know is that it gives you the opportunity to place yourself in this life no one chose to come here no one had a consciousness before they were here when people if you look at babies when they're born i mean they look upset to be, they're not happy to be here okay it's a, it's like what is this i mean if you ever seen a little kid um and this is not this is not research this is not like a probably to do with any kind of psychology research or philosophy research i've done this is just uh but that's a funny observation i mean if you look at a baby within the first few hours after it's born it's looking it's looking at everyone like what the fuck it's looking at everyone like what is this and who are you and why am i here and of course a child at that age doesn't have such a good memory it doesn't have such a good like prefrontal lobe to kind of execute complex thought which is um i'm not trying to claim that's what they do i'm not trying to claim that's uh that's what they're capable of so you know take everything i say with a grain of salt you know we didn't choose to come here and you know we realize that when we reach adolescence but i think that's partly the reason why people are so rebellious at that age uh because existence is so confusing and easy to say hey suck it up and, and especially for adults like us but we need to understand that remnants of that of that psyche still live within us and we don't we shouldn't ignore it and just kind of live blind to that we need to accept the fact that that aspect of of us was there it's the one that pushed us to um to being who we are and try to achieve what we can achieve within a lifetime because time is limited man you can never really tell how much time you have left and that's just a reminder this is something that you should be reminding yourself at any moment like you you plan to i don't know climb mount everest next year well you don't even know there's going to be a next year so it's it's that kind of uh impatience that i encourage within creatives and and entrepreneurs and inventors and it's often times the people who are free that bring the biggest change to the world most people that want to operate by the rule book set out by society don't change anything if they're not willing to think outside of the box then nothing you knew will be brought to the table you need to be able to think outside of the box you need to be able to to confront something that others weren't able to confront and for example flight human flight is just a, is a miracle if you just think about it, a ton of steel can just climb you know to just towards the sky and with like tons of weight people sitting there with luggage and just fly to another location all on schedule it's it's quite difficult to 
just to comprehend that this human being who has no wings managed just to come up with such a crazy way of trans crazy method of transport not many people think about this even a car everything we've done we see it as normal because we've been desensitized to it but you need to look at things through the perspective of those that were before us those who said look this is impossible that's not okay that's good and so, and so forth everything seems impossible when it's first done everything but then it seems so normal think about that for a bit the fact that things seem impossible you'll have a group of people telling i don't know a like an inventor oh you you can't do that that's not possible people you'll die and they think he's a quack he's crazy then it works now everyone's doing it oh it's part of life it's just part of just it's boring life everyone's flying everyone's uh you know trying out this new technology and and so forth it's just a question you have to ask yourself are you prepared to die knowing that you failed trying or possibly knowing that you've succeeded in what you want to do or are you happy to live without doing anything are you prepared to confront other people's criticisms and their remarks and you know they'll <laughs> especially if your idea is a bit wacky are you prepared to confront the humiliation the possible failure you need to accept the possibility of failure you need to accept that there's a possibility that you're going to mess up but you need to make that possibility strengthen you you need to have in your heart that whether you fail or not you'll get back up and you'll try again this has been said so many times i wonder if it's become a cliche it's been said everywhere you go any kind of inspirational video you find on youtube everyone keeps saying it you keep get back, keep getting back up keep get, keep getting back up it's almost taken away from its power look doing it and saying it are two different things you'll know those who do it by their success because those that keep getting up they'll always succeed if you don't try you have zero chance of success you have two choices you can either fail and 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 always have that small possibility that you know you'll figure something out you'll hit on something and everything will fit into place no matter how small that possibility is even if it's 1% or you can live without trying right defend your ego defend your you know this this fake facade that you put on in front of people right and have a zero chance of success because you're not even trying how can you succeed how can you even have any chance of success if you're not trying it's 0% and of course i'm i'm exaggerating the you know the chances uh, i i believe that the human mind is just an extraordinary thing you can achieve so much by by just thinking about something let alone practicing it and dedicating your time and and making it to a passion of yours and you know what this whole talk of death and career i i just realized it's not just down to career there's so many things i can spend days talking about this there are so many things linked to your perception and and everything and everything your all your dreams everything you do the way you treat people around you the way you treat your family the way you even the way you dream even those that dream big those that want to you know sky's the limit and do the impossible the catalyst of all great men has been death think about it the catalyst the whole idea of death is used so much in religion because when you point out to people that they will eventually die and they they you know they're not immortal then that's when they prepare to get off their ass and actually do something i want you to think about something and this is a thought experiment i created imagine that everyone was immortal for 
I don't know, for 10,000 years, no one would die. They would live forever and so forth. And imagine this, you know, this discovery or this thing happened like uh, years ago, 2,000 years ago, let's assume, before the invention of all our modern technology. You know, people won't do anything. There will be no change. Things won't break. People won't leave their comfort zone. Like, do, do, do what you feel comfortable doing, but don't be scared. Ever since the last episode where I spoke about comfort zones, but people tell me, Mo, what do you mean comfort zone? You know, I enjoy doing this. I'm not comfortable doing that. What do you mean exactly by it? And I think, let me elaborate on what I mean by comfort zone. That word is, I don't think it's the best word to use for what I'm trying to get at. I think there's a better way to describe what I'm saying. Another word for comfort zone I'm trying to say is the limitation zone, I should say. And by by discomfort, I don't mean doing something that's not you or something that will harm you. I don't mean that. I'm, I mean the, the discomfort of facing people uh, with just the huge possibility that that you'll fail and the, the, the discomfort, by leaving the comfort zone, I mean the discomfort of having your fate in your hands. To take responsibility for everything around you and for what you do. That's what I mean by not being in the comfort zone. Okay, I don't mean I want you to go out and do something that's, that's dangerous or stupid. Okay, you know, what, what you feel comfortable doing is there for a logical reason. But sometimes it's for illogical reasons, such as, oh, people will laugh at me. Who cares? Seriously, who cares? Have you, ha have you ever been humiliated in your life at all? If you haven't, you haven't lived. If you've never been humiliated and stood your ground, you're an idiot. You have to learn how to do just stand your ground and, and, and know, know who you are. Otherwise, you're living a complete lie, void of enemies, void of love, void of anything. So that's what I mean by comfort zone. So you just have to counter, just to counter balance everything. You have to balance everything out and... And put into perspective, what would you value more? Do you value other people's perceptions of you? Or do you value the perception that you have of yourself? The perception you have of yourself compared to those that lived before you. Those that succeeded in their life goals. And of course, I can talk about this for very long time i'll probably touch on it longer i'll even touch on in a couple of episodes i'll touch on the idea of nutrition and why you should actually take care of yourself if you want the best work possible and uh, especially if you're involved in sports and you want to be the most efficient you can be you know i'll try to cover the whole <laughs> subjectivity of uh scientific you know re reports on nutrition and and the paradoxes that they create and funding and corporation things like that for now it's time for questions let's see what we have in our mailbag from the clockwork brothers website the first question we have here is from dan the man and of course anyone that sends questions they're free to use whatever names they want to choose and he asks uh it's actually a question directed at me and it's about uh you know the shining serpent my novel and he asks you know how did you find the time to to write it like that's a really interesting question i think a lot of people have this problem they have this perceived notion that there's no time to do anything and you know what they're right there is no time to do anything you've got very little time this is why you have to do what you have to do you gotta you gotta make time for it you, you know you don't don't find time there is no time you gotta not only find time for yourself you have to make time for your family and for your friends you know, you, you, it's just like opportunities. You create them. Same thing with time. Uh, th there's opportunities everywhere. Perhaps there's a place you're going to and you're commuting and you can find time during that. For me, it was a bit different. For me, it was a kind of decision where this is what I want to do and this is a full-time thing and this is all I'm going to do. And at the time, that's all I spent doing for a couple of months. You know, the, the first draft that I wrote, I was pretty young. I was around 16 years old. I can't remember. I was 17 and it was immediately after the Iraq war, which kind of links with the book and how I felt at the time. And of course, after that, I, you know, I'd done my university degrees and I was, I was just about to go to do a doctorate. 
and I felt that I, I'd had enough of education. And I felt personally, I felt that the education system was very lacking. I felt that they they set you up a little bit in the UK. They don't really set things out for you. It's kind of a loaded. <laughs> it, it's a it's a double-edged sword. You know, you, you can spend time studying and being you know thinking for yourself and reading things but you know we won't really offer you any opportunities and i realized that instead of doing like an internship and wasting my time with someone that's using me for free labor i could uh, just do my thing and get better at doing my doing my work and my skills and i spent days just that's all i done i just i wrote i wrote and wrote and wrote free wrote and wrote and i kept doing it until i got better and better and it was couple i don't know if they are hundreds but loads and loads of drafts soon i thought it was ready and i was happy i'm still happy with it now i'm still happy with the shining serpent now it's a, a work that i go back to every now and then to read it and feel that energy that i had going for me back then that really kind of i find it inspirational myself of my mentality because i felt you know the more i i had more responsibilities during life the less i had time to um to really grow that inspirational but I, I i felt i wrote it in a time where I, I felt something i felt very strongly about something and i felt very strongly about my career path and right now my career path is always changing you know you should never start when you're 100 percent because you'll never be 100 percent or you, you, you find the time. How do I find the time to make this podcast? I have a lot of things to do on my list. I've got, you know, me, me and Hassan, we're doing our studio and we're doing New Empire and we're working on uh, so many things at the moment and we're just collaborating with people and meeting people. How do I find the time? I force, I have to force myself. But as, as, when you start, once you get into that flow, once you get to that creative zone, it doesn't matter. It's not about time. You lose track of time. You need to kind of practice your mental state. You need to practice how to control your, you know, your emotions. So you're you're not under the you're not under the influence of of your subconscious. You need to be in control of your subconscious. You need to have, find a way to communicate with that subconscious part of yourself. And everyone has it in a different way. So you can try what I do, or you can you can f find what works for you. But the whole time thing it's I, th I believe it's a complete excuse I if you really believe in something if you're prepared to die for something then <laughs> you wouldn't care if this time you'd stay up you know you'd sleep at you sleep very late when I was doing what I was doing okay even when I was in uni when I was, st I was still practicing my craft I'd sleep at five o'clock I'd wake up at I don't know I'd, I'd, okay I'd wake up pretty late for university that's beside the point I, I'd be on the way there uh, even if I was late and I'll be doing what I do I'd be practicing what I do I'd be reading I'd be and for a writer even for a musician you are as good as what you read you are as good as what you listen to for a filmmaker you are as good as what you watch so you need to take that on board wherever it is Dan the man and that's a really cool name by the way um let's see next question we'll have one more question and uh I promise I'll get back to more of your questions in the next episode so but just to make this episode more rounded out instead of me taking many questions with no not much input okay next question is from fen lee and he asks what keeps you going and how do you handle criticism okay i'm going to try to keep it as concise as possible because this is a question i can actually dedicate, i'll dedicate the podcast to this soon but i'll try to keep this pretty concise so so you understand my perspective on this how do i keep doing what I do now my answer my suggestion will really depend on where you are in your career and what your aim is and what you're doing and, and you know how absurd your dream might be and I respect all those that have dreams no matter how absurd they may be because who am I to judge the possibility and the, their capabilities but it really depends on where you are now <clears throat> for some people who, who have been conditioned very heavily from a young age to really be affected by criticism is going to be a long and hard process and with the way society currently is and this this, is, this applies to men as much as it applies to women there's a there's this kind of self-perception 
that people have of themselves. And this self-perception is kind of, uh, it's visceral and it's vicarious. It's uh, these are a bit of complex words. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll try to make it a little bit more uh, easy to understand. It's something that's deep within the person. It's not a logical thing and it's indirect. It's not something that they chose or something that they, it's something they've picked up along the way. For some people it might be image, you know, with the way image is portrayed in society, in magazines, in movies, and, and so forth. And to another degree, it's uh, it's how they've been treated. You know, some people, when you tell them, hey, you suck, don't do that, they stop. And others, they doesn't really affect them at all because they have a thicker skin. Maybe this, maybe it's, there's some aspects of genetics, some aspects of, of environment that are to play when this occurs. But for me, when I first started, you know, writing, whether it was poetry or or novels or screenplays, because I just jumped in straight in when I was young. I, you know, I, I wrote a novel, wrote, uh, wrote the uh, two screenplays, uh, wrote poetry collection. I was told that my screenplay sucked. Rewrote the screenplays. I was told my screenplay sucked. Rewrote the screenplays. Okay. Um, same with same with the book. It was like, it was like, well, you don't need someone to tell you if it's up to par with what you want. If if you've read enough books, if you've watched enough movies, if you've listened to enough music, you'll know where you want to be. I knew I could have I could have improved, so I kept reworking and reworking. But when I was when I really when I felt I was good enough, and I felt that I was making a lot of progress, I kept silent. I didn't tell anyone. No one deserved to know, because I didn't care what they said. I wasn't bothered to explain myself, and I didn't need to. And I felt really happy with what I'd done, and really comfortable with what I'd done. And this is something you get once you're very familiar with your with your medium. Once you know your stuff, you know you you can say this is a nuance. You can say you like it like this. When when you're in, and and you realize that's the only way to go about it. Uh, so yeah, you you can do that. You know, be, being staying silent is a good thing, especially if you're one of those people that believes others might jinx you. And there's also it's only later. Like right now, when I do something, I tell everyone about it because I'm proud and I'm happy with what I'm doing and I want people to know about it. And you have to share your work. You have to let people know. You can't be paranoid and scared that other people might might steal your ideas. You're just you're just stepping on your own toes when you do that. Um, but once you reach a really level of confidence and, and familiarity in your, in your field, that's when you can really start telling people. That's when you can be really thick-skinned and someone tells you hey i think this this is bad i think this is good you can you can you can you can accept it you can say okay that's their opinion i actually like it like this and i'm going to stick with it like this if you don't do that i mean it, sh it shows you haven't really quite reached it yet or perhaps you need to work on your personality more uh, this is not this is not actually to defend you Fendi. it's just, a, just anyone it's even me when i first started out and if 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 you start taking people's too much people's advice everyone will to tell you something different you know everyone will tell especially uh, let me give you an example a good example of this is the title to any of your works everyone thinks they have the perfect title for your work okay everyone thinks when i made the channing serpent i the, people said okay why don't you call it this or why don't you call it that you know they don't see behind the scenes for me the title had changed i'm not joking at least 12 20 times okay 20 times at least it changed so many times within the span of those you know nine years that when i got the shining when i got the title shining stuff and i was sure this is exactly what i wanted and no one can change my mind but even then even with all my thick skin and my, my and my self-belief they were still able to tell me hey you know what maybe you should call it dangerous something I'm like, oh god that's a terrible title like, no, no no but yours is a terrible title I'm like well I'll tell you what, uh, write something and you can call it whatever you want, okay? 
Uh, there's so much more that goes into our work, even with what, even New Empire, right? Me and Hassan, we sat down for hours and we racked up our brains. Uh, for every collaboration we've done, we can sit down. But again, there's a lot of respect. When I'm in my writing zone, Hassan gives me space. He he knows that there's so much going on in my head. And he knows it's just it's not a matter of luck and just kind of chosen on a whim. Of course, everything is arbitrary to a certain degree. And when he's doing his magic of storyboarding and, and creating things, and I'm not going to jump on and say, hey, hey, director, maybe you should do it like this. Or especially during filming days, unless I feel that there's a big reason for me to kind of really get involved unless I'm co-directing or, or unless I feel something may be sabotaged I'm not going to jump in and, and interrupt his work he needs to find his own space even with our with our sound guy we like him to have to experiment and have his thing and do his thing his way so by by being thick-skinned by learning to handle criticism you also open the channels to even more creatives and let them do their thing especially if you're if you like their work and you're comfortable and you're com and you're convinced that they're good and you respect them then you'll have that space at the same time i should also note that if you respect them if something is objectively broken or or there's a huge huge flaw that you can't really kind of look over then it will be disrespectful to them to not tell them so it really does depend on situation. It depends on your level of skill. It depends your, on your perceived level of skill. There are people that are, that are really good, but they think they're bad. And people that are really bad, but they think they're, heavy, they're very gifted. So there's all these, all these kind of psychological aspects at play. And you've got to kind of balance all of them out. Okay, this has been uh, this week's episode of podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. For more information, check out clockworkbrothers.com. Uh, to buy a copy of my book, you can get it off Amazon or you can go to the shiningserpent.com. Uh, the ebook is also now available on the website clock, www.clockworkbrothers.com. So you can download it as a free promotional offer for our website. We also have Hassan's uh, great studio, which is Odyssey Studios. If you want to check out more of, of his work, go to uh, odysseystudios.co.uk and uh keep keep up to date you can subscribe to our mailing list subscribe to our pinterest to our twitters and to our youtube thank you for listening and i hope you had a good time goodbye